Just Outdoors is brought to you by the following community supporters. Jervalin Hardware Hank, Deer River. Jervalin Hardware offers a broad selection of paints and sporting goods and a complete line of plumbing and electrical supplies. Jervalin Hardware, 108 Main Avenue, Deer River. Meridian Medical Clinic. Located in Grand Rapids, Meridian Medical Clinic is dedicated to providing quality medical care for every stage of life. Meridian offers a variety of family practice services, including on-site laboratory and digital radiography. Meds One Emergency Medical Services. Meds One provides mobile advanced life support, critical care response, and comprehensive EMS support services, such as response planning, education, event standby, and consulting. Hi, my name is Tom Chapin and welcome to Just Outdoors. This is a program to bring you the bare facts about the woods, waters and wildlife of Itasca County. And today we have a special guest with us, uh, professional fisherman, Tom Newstrom. Hi Tom, how you doing? Welcome to the show Tom. Thank you, thanks for having Appreciate me. Appreciate you coming in and you boy, we got a lot to talk about. Yep. A lot of stuff. Yep. So uh, first thing I do with my guests of course is uh, have them tell the audience who they are, where they're from, how they got to Itasca County and what you've done in the meantime. It seems like everybody was somewhere else, you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's always that way. But, um, you know, fishing has been in my blood since I was real little. And uh, I grew up in Chicago. Uh, I fished Perchtown Lake, Michigan, and we had a cabin in Hayward, Wisconsin. We'd go up there in the summer and, and fishing has always been my passion. It's just, mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I always remember a, a, a quote from one of my favorite movies, uh, that uh, I'm haunted by water. I love water, and and I think that's the the thing for me uh, that's driven me into fishing as much as I have been. And I moved up here uh, 33 years ago, and uh, I started guiding at Lake Geneva outside of Chicago before I moved up here, and I really enjoyed it. And uh, when I moved up here, I took a year to learn some of the lakes, and uh, I got a job as a deputy sheriff, but I also uh, guided on my days off and. Mm -hmm. And uh, probably, according to some people, I probably guided too much. But, <laughs> but, uh, but no, it, it was been a great learning thing, sure. and um, and I've uh, I've learned a lot. I learned something every time I go on the water. And I'll tell you, I uh, I love my customers. My guide customers mm -hmm. are great, and I'm one of these guys that loves what he does. You guide all year? No, I just guide. You know, in the sure. open water. I don't open guide. Water. Okay, water. okay. No. You're an open water guide. Yes. And of course, you use a lot. You go to a lot of different lakes in Itasca County, and yes. even out of Itasca County sometimes, right? I mean, well, we go to Red Lake, County, and, Red Lake, and we go uh, into Cass County. We fish okay. Leech and Cass Lake, and, and several lakes, and then even sometimes we get down into Aiken County a little bit. Okay. But uh, more off, you know, there's so much <clears throat> in our county here in Itasca County, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and even guys like Al Linder and some of the others said that we have the best fishing. In the entire state of Minnesota. Well, we have. I mean, with all the lakes, we got a thousand lakes in the county. Yeah. And, yeah I can, and, and they're all different kinds of species yep. between the trout and the walleyes and the northerns and the muskies. And it's, it's really an amazing county. 
Oh, it is. It's amazing. So and the fisheries are amazing. If you like water, you're in the, you're in the yeah, best spot. Oh yeah, you bet. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, we, we got like, uh, you know, many, many things to talk about here. We're going to get into uh, tackle. Or we're gonna, you're going to do some demonstrations. You're going to get into types of rods and all the equipment that you use. But I think the first thing uh, you said you'd like to start out with is uh, some information, uh, and bait shops and things like that in the area. You know, Tom, I think when people even come in our area, and even our local people, mm -hmm. um, We've got some of the best bait shops around. You know, you look at Ben's Bait, you look at River Rat, you look at, uh, you know, Fred's and Deer River. I mean, I can go in those bait shops and I can send my customers or even people call me up uh, quite a bit and say, you know, where can I start out? Where can I go for some information other than what you're going to give me? I'll say, you know, if you're coming through Rapid, stop at Ben's. If you're coming up a different way up six, stop at River Rat. If you're, you know, coming up a different way, stop at Fred's. Those guys give you good information. They have great bait. They're great uh, entrepreneurs of uh, bait shops, and and they have the tackle that you need. But they give you straight information. I know I've been to a few bait shops in my time where they kind of, <laughs> eh, you know, they, they kind of lean a little bit away from giving the scoop. But these guys are great. Well, one thing about those guys, they all fish. And they, they all fish uh, a lot. I yep. mean, I've, I've been in the Summers Bay Station where they just got in from fishing. Right. Uh, I mean, and the day before they were out. So they, they got some pretty pretty good information. Every owner of those bait shops is yep. a fisherman. Every right. single one, right. and like you say. And, I, and I've and i seen them on the water, and we they call me sometimes, you know, geez, I'm going out for the mm -hmm. day, and, you know, where, where, where are they biting, or where, where should I start? And you share that because they're, offer, they're going to offer me some information. Mm -hmm. I'm going to offer them some information. It's mm -hmm. a trade-off. Yeah, they don't hold back at all, that's for sure. No. And usually meet somebody in there at the time. Oh, yeah. Uh, when you're picking up bait, that's uh, always fairly interesting. You know, well, if they know where are they going, oh, where are you going? Oh, yeah, going and if they and know forth. you're a guide, you yeah, know, they'll stand there over the yeah. tanks and go, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think yeah. I'll take some of what he's getting, yeah, yeah, you know, which thing. is always kind of kind of yeah, funny. You know. times. All right, well, now we, uh, we, we're getting into uh, let, let, where you're going to go fishing and the equipment you need, but the first thing we want to talk about is if you're going to go out, you should have a good map. Right? Yeah, I, I, you uh, know, and I, I think it's How real, important are maps when you're going out? You know, if you've never been to the body of water, I think it's essential because you can, it's going to give you a starting Even point. a small lake, right? Even a small lake. And they're all yeah. pretty much available, aren't they? Yeah, and they are. You know, some of the bigger lakes, like, I like Lake Master. I mean, I like it because it gives me a real, you know, definitive way about mm -hmm. the map. You know, it, it just shows a lot of different things and a lot of starting points, you know. And it, it's kind of interesting where, you know, I'll give somebody a map or have them, you know, let them borrow one of mine or recommend a map. And if they look at the map, sometimes they got to start and look at which way the wind is blowing. Because, you know, like, for instance, this is Bowstring Lake. Mm -hmm. And say the wind is blowing strong out of the northwest. Well, you're going to have a hard time getting your boat off the northeast landing. You know, you'll have waves coming in, and it's it, pretty uncomfortable. But if you would have rolled, you know, went down to the south end mm -hmm. or went through maybe Bowstring Shores Resort or something, it would have helped you to get on the lake a little better. And then, you know, you kind of decide where the wind is affecting some of these spots. And that's why, you know, I like to pick up a good map if I'm going to a strange lake or I recommend a customer or anybody mm -hmm. calls me up, get a real good map. And all our bait shops and L&M and Glens, they all have these maps. So it, it's a good starting point. And you know what? If you buy the map, sit down with the bait owner or the, or the guy that's running the bait shop and say, do you know anything about this lake? Is it, where's a good starting spot for me for Northern Pike or for walleyes? Or, you know, my kids and I like to fish bass or panfish. And, you know, most of the time those guys will tell you. Mm-hmm. They want you to be happy. Yeah. Fish move around on a lake from day to day, too, don't they? Yeah, they do. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, maps may help you, but you still have to have the fish cooperate and the fish in an area where you're fishing. So location of where you're going to go fishing on that lake can change from day to day. You know, Tom, I think one of the, I'm glad you brought it up, because I think one of the biggest things that people do is they stay too long. On one spot? On one spot. And if okay. they went out there the day before and they caught them and, and they they caught a bunch of fish, you know, whether it was panfish or bass or walleyes, and then all of a sudden everything kind of changes up a little bit. Maybe overnight, maybe the wind switched, maybe, uh, you know, we got a different kind of system moved in, maybe it got too cold, you know, maybe it got too hot, maybe the wind quit. So they go back to the spot, they don't catch anything, but they'll sit there hour after mm -hmm. hour after hour. When, if they moved 150 yards or maybe even to another little point uh, down the lake, they would have caught, you know, some fish. So I think at times people stay too long on a spot. So you, you don't necessarily agree all the time with the statement, the fish aren't biting today. No, no. I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe that at all. Okay, so why? Well, because there's always fish on the lake that are gonna bite. I mean, 
you know, everything doesn't just stop. It's not like the restaurant's closed. You okay. know, it's not like uh, it's Christmas Day and there's no nowhere to get fast food. But you get that feeling out there sometimes when you maybe it is because you're staying on the, on the same spot all the time. But even moving around sometimes can be pretty, pretty slim out there. Yeah, so. but you got to remember that fish aren't in one group and move like move to the other side of the lake once the conditions improve. What you're doing is you're targeting groups of fish that are in different locations of the lake and you kind of. Oh, you kind of dial into what they're what they're doing or what they're feeding on or what the conditions are and you kind of have to make like a milk run so if you get a map and you pick out six seven spots on that map kind of take a marker and mark them and then you go from one spot to the other to the other or even if you know the lake you know you mm -hmm. might you know go back there and you're not catching them well you got to have some other spots to go to so a little prep time <coughs> with traps and trying to figure out where you might go on that lake if you don't catch them at, a, at the initial spot pretty important if you want to come back with some fish or you want to have some action yeah and you so. know and a lot of the big bodies of water you know you'll go out there I, I remember I took Sam Cook last year for the opener and um, his uh, camera guy we came out of Federal Dam and there was a hundred boats sitting out on a break and right away he goes I guess we're gonna start here aren't we and <laughs> Sam looked at me and I looked at Sam and I said nope we're going to a different spot he goes but they must be biting I said, well, you know, that's the other thing. Well, I we're said, all sucked into that. People, and yeah, we do. And sure. people, you know, especially if they haven't fished out there much, right. and they see 20 or 30 boats in the same spot, they're going to figure that they must be biting or something's going on there. Okay. It's not a bad deal, but eventually you're going to have to go off on your own and find fish that bite for you. Well, let's tell, tell the people that are watching here, what, what, what are you going to look for out there? I mean, uh, you know, you, you can talk about this. You go to different spots, but you as a professional fisherman, when you go out on a lake that... Maybe you're not real familiar with. Maybe it's a little newer lake. What do you do? Where do you go first? Um, I say in fish, June. I usually fish shallow. You fish you know, shallow. When I go to a lake, I up. usually fish shallow. And the reason why is... Is that all summer? No. Some, well, sometimes. You know, when I get okay. into September, I might kind of come off a deeper structure. And even in the heat of the summer, after a certain time, I might go out and fish offshore you know, okay. bars and humps and stuff. But if I'm going to a brand new lake, a lake okay. I've never fished before, mm -hmm. don't have much information about it, I've got a map, usually what I'll do is I'll start shallow. Now, is this for any species or just basically walleyes? Mm, quite a few. Quite a few species. Northern? Quite a few, northerns, bass, okay. walleyes. Because they're all after bait fish, basically, right? right? They have to feed, so. Right. And, you know, and there's a correlation there, too, you know. You, you remember that, you know, when these bait fish hatch, these small fish, and they can be perched, they can be little walleyes, I mm -hmm. mean, they, mm -hmm. shiners, all this stuff. When they hatch, the first places they are are shallow. And therefore, these fish know this. And, and they, weeds, too, and, right? And weeds. Yeah. And the first emerging weed beds mm -hmm. that come up are awful good, too. But um, they know that those small fish are in those shallow areas, and they'll go in there and hunt them down. And, and I'll tell you another story about Leech Lake as we get into this uh, about about actually with certain kinds of forage that uh, turn these fish on. Okay. But, but there again, they, they can dial into that and they know. And actively fishing, a, I, I like to fish a jig quite a bit, especially shallow. And I'm, I'm pulling a lot more spinners now than I used to and we'll show you some of those. But um, I like to cover water because I know I'm going to get in there and I want to find some active fish. So I'll go in shallow. How and, shallow? Well, sometimes five feet, four feet. Um, okay. Most often, you know, for most people, it's six to eight feet is, is pretty a, a good starting spot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll work those areas, little points and little turns. And, and uh, if I'm not catching anything, I'll move down the lake. I like where a wind is kind of blowing into it a little bit or it's coming down parallel to it. You know, it, it, I like something that kind of, oh, it kind of gets the water going, you know, kind of. Mm -hmm you know, causes, uh, you know, a little bit of uh, turbidity in the water. Uh, the small fish like to eat a lot of the, those little critters and, and also it cuts down on the, uh, on the clearness of the water. Okay, now is this uh, uh, pretty much the same during the day as the sun gets higher? Do you change your tactics a little bit? Not necessarily. It depends. If I got wind and, and I'm contacting fish, I'll stay right with them. Okay, I, so the they make you change your mood too, okay, you know, what they're sure. doing. You but know, the I, effect of the uh, the daytime does that have a lot of effect on the fish as far as the time of day, at noon compared to seven in the morning or five at night? I, it, you know, it sometimes, sounds like it does. Some, sometimes it does, but you know, the best time to go fishing is when you when can. Yeah, sure. And they only bite when you get there. Okay. And and you know, and I always look at it that way. And I've had guide trips where I had a miserable morning, 
And then all of a sudden, about 12, 30, 1 o'clock, midday, all of a sudden those fish just turned on just like that. And, you, and we caught lots and lots of fish in the afternoon. Sometimes I'll get out there and if the conditions are right and the bite is good, you'll get all these fish in the morning. And then all of a sudden about 12, 1 o'clock, it just seems like it'll slow down for a period of time. But you also have to look at the conditions. If the conditions changed and the wind started to stop a little bit, it got real bright out. Um, you know, the lake kind of went flatter and the food wasn't there. The food moved somewhere. Well, these fish are, that's all they do is eat and move. So that's what, all I, they do. what I hear you saying, Tom, is that <clears throat> the most important thing when you go out there is um, trying to find the fish. Mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily if the fish and the conditions are they going to bite or not, because most of the time it sounds like you're saying they're going to bite someplace on the lake. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. It's just a matter of location. Right. Location, location, okay. location. You know. So you, you locate them and you're probably going to have uh, some fair fishing. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't and it's a situation where they just aren't biting, um, you're probably not going to do very well. So you got to move around. And, and you know, just giving you an example of a classic yeah. lake in our area that, you know, so many of us fishing we guide on is winning. Sure. And you look at uh, the lake offers so many different patterns and ways to fish. but. You know, a lot of people don't understand with the shorelines on Winnie, over decades and decades and decades of big, huge waves, uh, they actually, especially up on the North Shore, there was a trench cut. There's a trench. In other words, if the water is like six, seven feet, then all of a sudden it goes up to four feet. All of a sudden it'll drop to five feet on the inside and go up to two, three feet on near shore. But there's a trench because of the wave action hitting the wave and then mm -hmm. they come back. Mm -hmm. So what they do is we call them washouts. Well, there was a period of time in the fall, um, and a lot of times I'll watch the birds, I'll watch the terns and megansers, and they're feeding on small minnows in the fall, and I'll watch them, and if they're up in the, that shallow water and they're four feet in those trenches, there's walleyes, there's lots of walleyes, there's pike, there's big perch in there, and a lot of people will not go up in there. They, they, won't, they, won't, they think that you're up there spinning your wheels. Yeah. But there, if there's if, fish. If there's bait there, there's fish there. Especially toward the end of the season? Or yeah, late fall. August oh. all the way into okay. the 1st of October. Okay, well, you know. so that's, that's that fall fishing type of thing. Huh? Yeah, but yeah. They'll, I mean, you can get them out. Some of my biggest fish I've caught in three, four feet of water. Okay. So, so you know, everybody thinks that they're always out in 22 feet or 20 feet, the big mm -hmm. fish. There's fish up in two, three, four feet of water okay. sometimes. Okay, so basically move around, surprise yourself. Yep. You're gonna be surprised if you do move around. Yep. If you're not catching fish, get the heck off that hole and go someplace else and yep. try to find them. Search yeah. them out a little bit. Okay, let's get into some tackle here because okay. you're kind of a tackle guy. I'm you almost tackle. gotta be, don't you? Oh, you gotta be a tackle <laughs> you guy. Gotta you know, you're, now you're, you're connected up with some tackle companies, yes. sponsoring and so yes. on. Yes. And so you must learn a lot about the newest innovations, the newest type of tackle coming out, all the jigs and everything, and the rods particularly. And boy, you take a Cabela's catalog, let's say, oh. there's like 50 pages of, of rods and fishing equipment in there, and where does a person start? Well, you know, I think a handful of jigs, you know, I mean, I, I, like I say, jig fishing, rig fishing, fishing a slip sinker rig, um, pulling spinners, those are three good things. And then, of course, crankbaits, which are like shad wraps, you know, and husky jerks and stuff from Rapala. And, and I've got, you know, I've got a box here and, and I've got a little book I'm going to show you too. But, you know, if I can learn or teach people how to fish four presentations, four presentations, whether it's, you know, whether I have okay. jigs. Well, let's take a look. Four presentations. So All right. Let's let's just start. You don't learn anything more today. Oh, you're gonna learn the four presentations. Oh yeah. Okay. You know, if you if you work on four things, and you All get right. pretty good at them, and now you got a you got a box full of jigs. Yep. But I got what's different what's colors what, in here too. What's the percentage of time you spent using jigs compared to other? Must be the majority of the time, huh? Probably fifty percent. Fifty percent. Probably 50. Crankbaits, uh, Crank not baits, high on your uh, list? Not as high on my list, no. But but there is a there is an application for them, and especially in the evening, because I'm covering water, I'm, I want to cover a lot of water trolling. Um, it's pretty hard to sit on a spot like you do during the day and cast, and you know, if you're trolling with a crankbait at say two miles an hour, and you're holding the, holding the rod, and all of a sudden, whack, you get a bite, it's a lot more applicable for what you're gonna be doing. If you're sitting there jigging, sometimes you can't see, 
you know, and, and or fishing with a rig and you feel the bite, but you can't see the line to set the hook sometimes. So, you know, we troll a lot of crankbaits at night. I know some of the guides in the area do. I know Sean Coulter and, and a few other guys like to go out at night, but you know, that's what they like to do and that's fine. But I think, uh, you know, when we look at uh, covering water, I like to cover water with a jig and I'm guiding during the day. I don't guide at night. And um, I think it's probably the most universal bait that was ever created. Fresh water, salt water, a jig will catch fish anywhere. And we're talking not just walleyes on a jig. You no, can we catch, catch everything. You can catch everything. With everything. It. Northerns, crappies, crappies, the whole thing. So you if you've got a set of jigs running from a 30 seconds ounce all the way up to half an ounce, you're doing pretty good. You've got yeah, pretty and, much and you should done. have several different weights. Half ounce starts to get a little bit too heavy. It's too bulky right. for people. And the heavier that the jig is, the quicker you have to set the hook. So if you've got a three-eighths or half ounce jig and you feel a bite, you set right away. That's a that's a rule they'll of drop thumb. it because of the weight, right? They'll drop it because of the weight. Okay. So most often what we do is if we're fishing in like, oh, and I do, I use a lot of three-eighths when, uh, when the fish are a little deep early and the water's cold, okay. 22 feet of water, and I've got people fishing right over the side vertical with them, I'll use a three-eighths. And I teach them to set the hook right away. As soon as they feel the, the bite or the weight, set, set up and start reeling. Okay. And they catch quite a few fish. Now, with a lighter jig, you can let them grab it. They can swim off. And I'll, I'll explain this. We call it loading up the tip. And what happens is the tip of the rod will bend just a little bit. It's not a big bite. Sometimes the tip will just bend a little we'll bit. All that, yeah. And then you set the hook and reel. So, you know, and then usually a lot of times with a lighter jig, they'll grab it and they'll swim with it a little bit. So. Okay. You know, have your jig set right away, lighter jig, you know, give it a, give it a few seconds. Good tip. Yeah, good. but, you know, I got different color jigs. Um, if you look in my box, uh, I've got a lot of greens in here. Yeah, you know, there's a whole bunch of different green color jigs in here. I like greens and shades of chartreuse and yellows um, for most of our lakes in this area. And the, why, the reason I do is because they catch fish. And, you know, if I go to a lake that's got a, yeah, and if they, it's got a little color to it, uh, sometimes I'll use some shades of yellows and oranges, like uh, Sand Lake, for instance. It's a good lake. Uh, it's got a little off color. Bowstring's the same. I'll use uh, something maybe not as green or have as much chartreuse in it, and I'll go to something with a little bit of orange or color in it. I see you got mostly red hooks. Is that a... You know, did the red hooks catch us, too? I, you know, I don't know. I caught an awful lot of j you know, fish on jigs with uh, black and bronze hooks, mm -hmm. but, oh, you know, I think it's one of those things where mentally... If I think it, it's going to put more fish in the boat for myself or my customers, um, I use a lot of red hooks now where I didn't years ago. Um, is it that extra little thing that mm -hmm. uh, some scientists said that if they see blood or, or something like that, they might be attracted to the, that color red? But when you go deep, they never see it because red is one of the first colors to disappear. Disappear. Uh one more little thing. Uh, do you sharpen your hooks or do you need to anymore with the new, newer type of hooks? You, you know, I bring a sharpening. Uh, I, in fact, the one I use, I use a Lure Jensen, which is a, you know, it's got mm -hmm. a yellow handle on it. It's mm -hmm. the best file I've ever used in my life for sharpening hooks. The only time I'll ever sharpen a hook usually is with, uh, if I'm around wood or uh, rocks and I get snagged once in a while and I bring it in and I check the point. But other than that, these hooks are so sharp today the new compared ones. to yeah. 20 years ago and beyond. It's incredible. So right out of the uh, package, they're they're pretty good shape. Oh yeah, they're 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 real good shape, and you know. But it's still important to have a sharp hook. Oh yeah, well you don't want to have uh, like this is a kind of a neat color here. They call this bubble gum. This is from Northland, and I I really like this little jig where the water's got a little bit of color to it. You know, it just uh, it gives them that just that extra little little thing that they can see that might attract them to you know to strike the bait. Now are you talking minnows and uh, leeches? minnows, leeches, and a half a crawler. I never use a whole night crawler on a jig, never. Okay. I only use a half, half a crawler. crawler. Yep. You hook them once? I tear, just tear it through and I string it on just like I would like a, a, oh. um, like a twister tail. Sure. Okay. I just put it on the same way and I use mm -hmm. a half a worm. And I catch an awful lot of fish that way. Small leeches or big leeches? Medium to large. Medium to large. Yep, I don't, okay. think, uh, I don't think you really need these, uh, we call them mud flaps. You know, <laughs> the big but, one, uh, yeah. <laughs> excuse me, but uh, we call mud flaps those big monster jumbos. Yeah. You know, are, am I going to catch a big fish with it? I might. I've caught an awful lot of big fish on Small. medium to largest, you know. Um, and, you know, for the people that uh, think about leeches, if you ever saw the size of the leeches that the fish actually eat in the lake, they're, they're less than a half inch long. Sure. 
the little gray rock leeches are real little. Mm -hmm. But it's the, what happens is it's the target. The target is bigger, there's right. more smell, but the target and it's that, you know, the presentation when that leech goes by and Movement. they see that thing, mm -hmm. you know. Sure. It's like the mambo dance, you okay. know, when that leech goes by and they go after it. But, okay. but there again, you know, I mean, this is a, you know, this is a pretty bread and butter jig box right here. Mm -hmm. And this is, a, this is another thing from Plano Tackle that's kind of cool right now is they develop these, uh, these boxes that are totally waterproof. And we haven't had a waterproof box uh, like this for, I, I, don't, I don't even remember when we had one like this. Um, I'll kind of show you with this um, smaller pail one. Right down here. You got some water in the pail here. Yep. Okay. And now that's another uh, Plano type. Right, it's a uh, Plano box, case. and they come in about three or four different sizes. And I just want to make some waterproof. Is there a there's a, a ring? A ring there's around. like a like oh. an oil ring. It goes all the way around, and the clamps are really strong. The, I mean, you're you're talking some major, you know, major clamps on these things. Yeah. You know, it's not just a little lift. I mean, you gotta you gotta pull on. It's it a positive much. thing to have something waterproof with your equipment. Isn't it? Otherwise, well, you yeah, don't dry but, it out. But you know, Tom, even in the boat, right. you know, with the condensation sure. and stuff in the rain and, and everything, in your boxes and in my, a lot of my boxes, the stuff gets a little bit of rust in them right. because of the condensation where it doesn't get in here with this. But you can actually, you know, I can actually put this thing in there. And if you notice, there's no bubbles coming up. You know, there's no bubbles mm -hmm. coming up in the box at all. Mm -hmm. You know, where if I had I didn't Boy. have a good seal on it, right. you know, mm -hmm. it would, you know, you would have all kinds of bubbles on there because you know you would be seeing that the, you know, you'd be seeing that the uh, the water is kind of oozing in there, or getting in there. Mm -hmm. If I did that with uh, maybe this box here, if it was yeah. smaller, you would see all kinds of bubbles going on. But there again, you've got you know, you've got three sides here. And everything's perfectly dry totally inside. Dry. Yeah, perfectly Boy, dry. That nice. Yeah, these and, and nice. these are the kind of boxes that you want to purchase when you go somewhere. You know, when you go to L and M or Glens or somewhere or one of the bait shops, you want to get this kind of box because it'll keep your stuff dry in the boat. You should. You should. No matter what kind of box you have, I mean, if you have those, that's great. But people should dry their tack a lot at the end of the day. Should oh, they? they should. Yeah. You Open should everything wipe. up. Yeah, get it dried out because you know. And I keep my boat in the garage, and, yeah. and a lot of guys, you know, especially the guides do. And we open up our all our our little uh, everything that we have in there open that's enclosed. Get the moisture out. Yeah, we open them up. You know, so it, it's kind of kind of neat. So if you you know if you get over to the stores and they don't have this, this is a new Plano waterproof box. Plano and got waterproof them like box. Four sizes. Wow. So okay. I mean, it's uh it's pretty unique. Okay. You know? Um, All right. Let me talk. Let me talk sure. a little bit about um, I, I, just a, a real uh, short deal here. And it, uh, mm -hmm. you know, when you're going to go out and get, you know, buy some jigs or something, look at some of the newer colors too that have a little bit of glow in them. Like this, for instance, this jig right here is a glow green. And what it does is it uh, it reacts to the light, so it has a lot more glow when it's under the water. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the last, I would say, 15, 20 years, I use a lot of different style of glow jigs, and I think it, it adds, adds to my success. And because, uh, you know, in the spectrum of things, the color disappears. Mm -hmm. And when you have a glow jig, the glow will actually stay down, it'll stay on there for several minutes. It, it's not like an hour or two, it's just a few minutes. But that's what we've gotten into quite a bit of that. Um, when you're selecting a rod, um, let me kind of get this. Let's uh, talk about rod and line at the same time yeah, here. Yeah, we're uh, gonna, see that's some special line on there. It sure looks different on that reel. <laughs> this is some. This is some stuff from Suffix. Um, uh, I really like this line. It's uh, you know it's one of their newer lines. I like the green. Very very smooth, very smooth soft, but very strong. This uh, line was in Europe for about four or five years before they actually brought it over and. Um, it uh, it's some of the best stuff I've ever used. Small diameter, I mean, very small there. diameter. And how many pound is this? Six. Six pound. I use six and eight. Six for walleyes, eight. yeah. I don't. Uh, very very seldom do I ever use four. Crappies? Very seldom. Crappies I use two and four, but mostly four. Okay. And I can get away with uh, six in this real light, you know, this real light line, you know. Um, this is a Daiwa Fuego. It's got six ball bearings, real light, real smooth. Uh, it has a real good uh, bail system on it. Uh, this is kind of a unique rod. This is a, a fellow Gary Dobbins from California designed this rod, and he was—he's a bass fisherman. But he got together with myself and two or three other guys, and he actually asked us for our input on what we think a good walleye rod would be. 
and we sent him a couple of our rods, our favorites, and he basically came out with a really nice group of rods that he designed. So again, if you see them in the store, pick them up and take a look at them. And they got a big emblem on them that says Dobbins. But here's the thing, Tom, that most people don't understand, is when they go purchase a rod, you know, and you're gonna jig fish or even maybe you're gonna rig fish, get something that's got a fast tip. And when we say a fast tip, the rod bends in that top third of the rod. It bends in the top third, okay? And then you have stiffness starting okay. to come back, and of well, course it doesn't see, yeah, bend in the back. Uh, yep. Not all rods do that. No, they don't. No, they start bending right, right to the beginning. Right, and that's just a normal, you know, what they call parabolic normal. What's the advantage of that? Well, what I can do is I have real good sensitivity in the tip, but I can set the hook real quick. That's mm -hmm. what they call a fast tip or fast action mm -hmm. rod. A slow taper is like a fly rod where it bends almost the whole entire length of the rod. So That'd be the opposite of this. Right. Yeah. So what we've done over the last several years now is we fish a lot of fast tip rods because it's quick. It's quick mm -hmm. in your hand. I can feel the bite. I can set good. I get a good set on the fish. And there's mm -hmm. the other thing. I think people set the hook too hard on fish. With the sharpness of these hooks today, Don't need there's to. no reason to. Just a nice pull. You know, I just, I just really honestly, I just pull the rod instead of this big set that we see some of the, our favorite heroes on TV do sometimes. It, all you got to do is pull. And with a rod, you're probably not putting more than one and a half to two pounds of pressure right. on that fish, are you? Right. No, you're not. Yeah. But they have different actions. You know, there's different rods for different things, you know. And, yeah. and I think, uh, you know, when you look at... Uh, it's certain rods, I mean, like, if I'm trolling with a rod with 150 feet of line out with a crankbait, I want something that's got a little bit more, you know, a little bit more body to it because I've got so much line and, I, and there's stretch involved. That's why we use a lot of these uh, braided lines now. But, um, you know, you, you have to power the fish a little bit more with all that line out. So, you know, we use a different style of rod for that. But this is a great all-around jig rod and rig rod, you know, so a guy doesn't have to go out and say, well, this guy wants me to spend all this money on these three or four different rods. This one, you can fish multiple presentations sure, with. Okay. No, that's about six foot, six, six eight. This six eight, six, six and a half foot. Oh, little, yeah, it's a, okay. it's a nice show, rod. Show, uh, Notice the handle uh, is different too? Yeah, I see that. What's, uh, what's the secret there? It's uh, just a different. It, well, you know what? It's, it's uh, kind of one of these things where several rod companies, um, we always call it the poodle, the yeah. poodle handle. You know, just because it's set up that sure. way. But um, what they do is uh, they pull the handle up farther. And I like to fish with my index finger right on the bottom of the rod. It kind of gives me a little extra feel on there. And it's very comfortable to fish. Mm -hmm. You know, some guys don't, they like all cork. I really think that this new style has balanced, give it a better balance of the rod. Less and uh, mm -hmm. it's really comfortable to fish all day. But again, you know, when you hold a, a spinning reel, you want to hold it between these two fingers. Mm -hmm. You know, you can hold it up here if you want. But I hold it between the two, or right between the four, so I can get my index finger right on top of the rod. It gives me a little bit more sure. feel. Sure. So, uh, sh show that little trick about how you, uh, you transport the line on your rod. This is so simple. It's so right. simple, but boy, I'll tell you, it's just sure what, happen done. what happens is, you know, Help and we you. all do it. We, we grab four or five rods, we got them together, we put them in a boat, and away we go. You know, right. you get out to the spot, and you go to tangle, pick up tangle. the rod, and, you know, it's <laughs> like pickup sticks. You got stuff all, you know, messed up. Yeah. And what we do, what I do is I take the line on the hook keeper like this, and I just wrap it one time around the big guide, just like that. And That's what it, it does is it pulls all that line together and you don't have the line. You don't off. have this line hanging That's out right. here to catch on That's right. hooks and other things from the other rods. Yep. Nothing here. No. So all yeah. it is is a, Okay, you know, should do that again. Okay, all it is is a wrap. Pretty simple, but. Yep, it's, it's just a real, you know, it's a real simple wrap. Sometimes it's even easier when I got my glasses on, but um, so I can show you. Let's start, let's start from scratch. We go, you know, you're, you're getting all set up. Okay, okay now you put, you put your, hook. your hook on there. You go to the next spot, all right? And before you go to the next spot, you just take the line. You can, you can pull it to the left like this. Just take it, and then you just turn it. And put it and over just the put big, it right over the big, big guide. guide, the big stripper guide. Right? Easy to get off, easy to go. That's right. And you don't have all the tangles. Yeah. So it's just a, it's a little trick, yeah. you know. 
Where did I learn it? No. Down the ocean. Yeah. Well, well, the ocean guys taught me how to do that, as he's taught me several different things. We would have learned that 40 years ago. We'd have saved our yeah, yeah. time, right? Yeah, we wouldn't have had so many <laughs> tangled rods, you know. Yeah. Um, okay, sure. you got a lot of other rods there, so let me uh, Let me now. show you something else here real quick. And um, this is kind of a, um, a different style of, of uh, doing stuff. But um, in fact, you know what? Let's put this rod down, and I'll come back to that one. Um, we talk about rigs. Um, a lot of people here fish leeches and crawlers. You know, it's kind you're of. You're talking a, about a rig. You're talking about slip a, sinker rig. A slip Lindy, sinker Lindy, rig. Lindy Northland rig. Thing. You know, something like that with a slip sinker. Um, but a lot of local guys. Um, in fact, some of them, good ones, have taught me uh, to do things a little differently at times from now, from before. Mm. Um, I was a big, you know, one with a Lindy style or a Northland style sinker. But I use a lot of interchangeable sinkers now. So what I do is. Um, is this one here, for instance, has got a little, um, it's got a little deal on it that I can actually take that sinker off and put a heavier one on. Or, or is that a nice it. deal? Because otherwise, you'd have to cut your line, get it off in the old days. Yeah. Well, I mean, with us, we carry you know like yeah. 15 rods, so I could just grab another one. But for the average guy, this is this is great. These are called Gremlins. These sinkers, and they, all the bait shops have got, and it's like a little bell sinker. But there's a, a local guide um, out of Grand Rapids, a good friend, Kurt Tackeron, kind of showed me how to do this. And then I put a bead between the swivel and the weight. Now, why, why do you think I put the bead there? Uh, protection of the swivel? I don't protection know. Protection of the knot on the swivel. The it's the a swivel. shock absorber. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. We came up with this 25 years ago. And we've done it, uh, and I think every guide I know just about fishes that way. But um, it's kind of cool, and you can just change. You can just take this, uh, you know, just take the sinker off. Put another one on. That put another one on. Whatever your, uh, situation yeah. you're fishing in. Yep. And I see you got quite a long uh, leader there. It's yep. like about four feet or so. Oh, I fish, you know, I fish a lot of leaders. I fish eight feet sometimes. Leaders are eight feet. Okay. Yeah. Um, if I'm putting air in a crawler or the fish are kind of off the bottom quite a ways, um, a lot of times I'll, I'll use a real long leader to get the bait up off the top. The longer the leader, the farther the bait will come off the top. Yeah, and, and then you control that with your speed. You know, you yeah, control that sure. with your electric motor or, or whatever you're using it to control your speed. But again, you know, changing up your sinker is real important. And Do you want your sinker to be on the bottom all yes, the time while you're trolling? Yes. Yes. I think I, that's I, a big, uh, I, I don't think everybody does that. No, but I think uh, they put too much line out, you know, th to reach the bottom. They put way too much line out because now, you know, instead of changing their sinker and they moved out to 20 feet of water and they got a quarter ounce sinker, now they got to let all this line out and you really, it changes the presentation. And what we like to do is keep the sinker as close to the boat as we can. And what we can do is we never just sit there and drag it. We're always, we move it. Lift it, drop it, drag it, lift it up, drag it. So that bait kind of looks like it's trying to get away or something. Because if that, if you look at anything, a minnow or a crawler or anything, and it moves at the same speed all the time, some fish will bite it and some fish won't. But if you change the action and you make it a little bit erratic once in a while, you're going to get a lot more bites. And you'll catch more fish. Okay. Good. So I like to use colored hooks. I'm, I'm a real big fan of it. Um, again. Um, I used to use a lot of black and, and bronze hooks, caught a lot of fish, but I used to put a bead ahead of it. I put a, a colored bead ahead of the hook. Now I use mostly colored hooks. And is it, uh, is it the most important thing? I don't think it is. But mentally, if it helps me to catch more fish, I'm going to use a colored hook. Okay. You feel comfortable with it? Yes, I feel okay. very comfortable. That's good. That's what you want to do? Yep. If I'm fishing real clear water, a lot of times I, I use just black hooks. Okay. Plain black uh, or bronze hooks, but if I'm fishing water that's got a little bit of color to it, and I'm not fishing real, real deep. You know, I'm fishing probably mm -hmm. 20 feet or less. I like colored hooks. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Well, there again, and then you know, with this rod, this is a seven footer. Um, if you look at the, the action on it, it also again. has that's a fast tip mm -hmm. because I can I can set the hook real mm -hmm. quick with this fish. What are we talking about price on something like that, that rod? Well, you know, the real good rods, you know, the real good ones, um, like this Dobbins rod, Loomis, and a few others, you know, you're looking at 175 to almost $300 for the top end rod. Uh, do you need a rod like that? No. There's a lot of companies, Fenwick and a few others, that make real nice rods for 75 80 bucks, and they'll do you just fine. 
you know, I think uh, with me as far as, you know, working on some of these projects on designing the rods and working with the companies and then when my customers get in the boat, they use the same rod I use, the same style, the same uh, value, you know, I don't give them a, a $30 rod to use when I'm using a $250 rod. Sure. And a lot of times that even incorporates a sale. If they like the rod, they caught a lot of fish, they're going to yeah. say, you know what, I'm going to go buy that rod. Yeah. And that's that impression that you, with that one-on-one -on -one teaching of a guide, that can really have a, a lot to do with what they purchase. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I see you got some spinners. Uh... Yeah. And again, you know, we're changing. You know, we're changing again. Um, this is a, and I got to thank one guy that kind of opened my eyes uh, to one thing. And um, I fished spinners 40 years ago. When I was down Lake Geneva, I fished a lot of spinners. And uh, Bill Broberg local guide from here, a friend of mine. Uh, he started pulling a lot more spinners uh, than the rest of us were. And he was catching fish at certain times, especially in shallow water, when we would be not struggling totally, but we were not doing as well. And it's a very simple rig. I, I like single hook spinners. I like single hook and I like gold blades hmm. or copper. That's what I like. And uh, sometimes silver if the water's real clear, but it's a real simple little rig. We make a lot of our own. This is a Northland spinner, that a uh, component that we actually buy the spinners and make our own. But they have them available in packaging too. But I like the single hook. And I run either a minnow, a leech, or a half a night crawler. Okay, that's what I was saying. It's the same kind of bait. Yep. It's actually a rig with a spinner. Right. right. The biggest difference with this is the rod, if you look at the rod, it's softer. You see where the rod is bending now? It's bending about halfway up. Mm -hmm. I like a little bit softer. And what happens is what we what we call when the rod's a little softer, or even on the fast tip, when we get a bite, all right, or we get a hit, what we like to do is we like to load the tip up. This is loading the tip up where you have a slight bend in the tip, and then all of a sudden you'll drop the rod back to the fish and set because he, usually he's on there. You know, if you just get a, a bite, a quick bite like that, most often they bumped it and they don't have it. But if you get them to load up that tip before you set, they usually most often have that bait in their mouth. And, and you're going to catch a lot more fish if you do that. Just hold them on the rod tip for three or four seconds mm -hmm. and tighten up to them and set and you'll catch a lot more fish. Um, the reason we don't use sometimes a whole crawler is a lot of times they'll nip it on you. We use, uh, I don't use three hook harnesses, I use two when I use a, a whole worm. Sometimes I do use a whole worm, not very often anymore. But um, what happens a lot of the times is they'll nip off the back end on you, just like a perch will do. Or well, I was going to say go. perch might be yep. involving perch there too, yep. right? Uh, you yep. Catch more perch that way if you got a longer? Uh, sometimes with the longer crawler, you'll, yeah, you'll, 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 they'll nip the tail off right. on you. You don't, you don't know what you have there. No, yeah. that's right. And you know, even if I get on a hot bite, like a hot rig bite somewhere, and I'm, say, I'm in, say I'm over on Jesse Lake and I'm on one of the humps and it's uh, 19 feet of water. And uh, all of a sudden, I'm looking at, uh, you know, I, I see all these fish down there, and I catch one, I get another one, and I get another one. And sometimes, and if it's on a worm bite, I'll just put, even on a rig, I'll put a half a crawler on. I don't even, I don't even put a whole crawler on sometimes when I'm fishing a rig, okay. because they're so active, and they're going to they're gonna eat right now, and, and it's a great way to mm -hmm. think, so. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So uh, you go out, you must have, what, uh, half a dozen rods when you go out? I got 15. 15 <laughs> rigged, I got 15 rigged rigged rods okay. uh, usually and when usually I have them all rigged up, up ready to go for different uh, conditions, I suppose. Huh? Yeah, and, and you know, it, it, the other thing too, I was going to show you too, is I use a bullet weight. Okay. And most guys say, well, I, you know, I'm not a bass fisherman. It has nothing to do with it. When we fish shallow water, this bullet pulls through the weeds a lot easier. Oh, sure. You know, if you use a, a standard other type of sinker, what happens is they'll get hung up and this one will slip right through. Okay. So does it, is it 100% perfect? No, but I'll tell you what. Semi-weedless. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, and what happens with the spinner, if you're yeah. moving at say two miles an hour, anywhere mm -hmm. from 1.5 to 2.5 miles an hour, we like to pull our spinners. The spinner is gonna rise up a little bit higher. So what you're looking at is you're looking at an angle with the sinker here and the spinner maybe a foot off the bottom and they might be out of that weed area and you can actually fish a lot uh, more efficiently when you use these bullet sinkers in shallower water. Okay. And what's shallow water? You know, 12 feet and less. Right. 
That's what I look at. No, uh, you mentioned speed. You know, two and a half miles an hour is pretty fast, isn't it? It on, is, on, but uh, sometimes somebody? you know you're triggering fish. You know, right. sometimes you'll you'll get on some fish that. Uh, are kind of negative, you know. They're not on a real positive bite, and a lot of times when you speed up on them, you know that'll that'll trigger that. It doesn't bite. give them a chance to look at it that quick either, does it? That for that long no, time, they, so they're either going to strike or they're not. Right, right. You know, they might, and you might just pass them by. But a lot of times when you speed it up, and that's the other thing too about speed. Um, I think a lot of people get so dialed into going one speed, and you got to change up on them. You know, you got to vary the cadence of what you're doing. You know, that mm -hmm. bait has got to look like it's something that's going to attract that fish. And a minnow doesn't swim like in a swimming pool. Doesn't He's not a swimmer. He doesn't dive in the water and swim to the end of their end. They start, they stop, they dart. You know, mm -hmm. They don't just go in one direction at one speed. So I think it's important to people, what, I don't care if you're working a jig or a spinner or a rig, to make sure that you vary the cadence on what you're doing. Yeah. See, a lot of people, it seems like uh, maybe uh, trolling, uh, sometimes a little too fast. You see a few out there. Uh, yeah, mostly pike guys. I see a lot of pike guys right. trolling really fast, you know. And, and, and that's okay, too. Well, it's okay. You know, the spoon guys. I always say the spoon right. guys that I, yeah. I see going over the weed beds and stuff. And, and they're trolling, a, you know, a red-eye wiggler or a daredevil or something. And, and they're going at a pretty good clip, you know, probably three and a half, four miles an hour. And, um, and they catch fish, you know, they, they're looking for the active biters, you know, but most often we don't, uh, we don't troll that fast, even with the crankbaits. And, um, if you're after Northern Pike, is trolling at uh, one and a half to two and a half, is that adequate? I like a little quicker. A little quicker, okay. Yeah, they're, they're the wolf. I mean, yeah, they're chasing, yeah. you know, they're chasers. Yeah. And, and I think, uh, I think that's kind of a, yeah. a, a thing that we always kind of look at. Even when I'm casting a bucktail for muskies or pike, yeah. I'm working it quicker than I would for a bass or walleye. Oh, good. You know, okay. I wanted to uh, show you a little bit, um, too. Um, this is my hook box. This is my bread and butter hook box that I have all kinds of okay. different colored yeah. hooks. Yeah, like, a little bit like that. And I have colored beads. I've got soft glow beads and I've got regular, you know, hard beads. And, um, you know, this is my, you know, I mean, this is like, that's my office. Mm -hmm. And I've got to have all the equipment there. You know, I got my swivels and snaps and, and um, all kinds of different things, split shots, bullet sinkers, uh, you know, and then of course here's the, uh, the sinker I was earlier talking about that most people, you know, most people in our area fish are these type of, we call like a shoe. Mm -hmm. But that's like a Lindy or right. Northland that's style Lindy, sinker. Lindy type sinker. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's pretty standard. But that uh, that Gremlin that I talked to you about, where you can switch it on and off, I think is a huge deal. You know, I mean, I, I think that people, if they fished it more, they would understand that a little bit better. But mm -hmm. there again, it's a you know, you got a good array of stuff here, and it'll get you know, it'll get me through the whole season. Okay, how do you normally attach your leader to your line? All right, I'm going to show you real quick. Okay, that's uh, you can do it so many different ways. Well, you know what? Um, it's uh, in fact, what I'm going to do. Um, this will this will be the easiest one for me to use. Um, Let's here. Let's uh, let's let the bear hold that rod. Let's let's try this one here. I got some line on here. Yeah, hold that for mm -hmm. me, please. Okay. First thing, you're cutting the line, getting all the. Uh, well, you know, I'm gonna, you know, just say I'm gonna make a leader. I'm gonna make my own leader. Okay. Well, let's just uh, let's oh, just okay. put it put it that way, mm -hmm. and we'll put that to the side. Okay. Um, I'm going to make uh, I'm going to make my own leader, and what I do um, can you can you see that Tom or is it pretty? Hold thin? it up uh, right next to your black, and I think the camera should pick that up pretty. You know what? There. Let me use a little heavier line. Okay. Okay. I I, I feel a lot more comfortable. That I think pretty that tough was, to see uh, even here. That's pretty light stuff there. Let, let's use something. Looks like that, about three pound. Huh? That's probably about two pound. Okay. Let's uh let's use something a little got a little bit more heaviness to it, and. Uh, Okay. Now what I do, all right, I'm going to, you know, I'll just pick a hook out. It doesn't really matter which hook it is, but I want to pick something out that folks can see. Um, I use a lot of hooks that are reverse eye where I'm going to snell them. And snelling is a different process. There's two or three ways to do it, but I do it a real quick way. I've got a way because I can do it in the wind. If I've got a 25 mile an hour wind out there and you're going to sit there and try to tie and twist all these knots, it's pretty difficult. 
And what I do is I just grab the end and I go in the back end of, of this. Okay, so you're coming out, coming out through the back of the, of the eye. So you went in the front, actually, I don't know what's the front or the back. I always call this the back. Do you? You, okay. know, I, the back. you know, I go okay. through the back, but I, while the hook is kind of laying, you know, flat like this right. with, the, with it down, mm -hmm. okay? Then I take it and I go back through it again. Oh, so you double. So I, I loop it up. You got double line around that eye. Right. No. Okay. I pull this down. All right. So this is what it looks like. You've got a tag. You got the tag sitting up on top. This has gone through twice now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now what I do is I take my two fingers like this. All right. And I figure eight it. Just like that. Three times. That's not going anywhere, is it? No, nope, it's not going anywhere. So you just figure eighted that three times over the end. Yep. And pull it tight and there you go. And you're done. Boy. And the thing is, it's that's a lot. Uh, it's strong, easier but you than want. The, but see, you want the hook to hang straight. Now, if I tied a regular knot, like a clinch knot, it would hang crooked. And and you're not, you know, mm. it's strong, mm. but but it's very simple. You know, I mean, I can do it blindfolded because I've been doing it for so many years. But it's very simple. You know, a lot of guys do it differently, and it takes them a while. And then what happens is if the wind's blowing, the line gets caught in their fingers, and then they're, they're jazzing around, around, and then around, then they're yeah. wrapping around through. Right. This is simple. You know, if you, you can get that thing twice through your eye, you're, right. you're ready to go. Just yeah, so if you need glasses, put them yeah. on. <laughs> and I'm, I'm close, but uh, I can still do it without the glasses. But I think uh, if people learn to do that, it's probably one of the neatest way to snell a hook. Because most of the hooks that we buy now for rigs, you know, we're fishing leeches and crawlers and that, have a reverse eye on them, or what we call a downward eye, which is, is uh, Eagle Claw makes hooks that has the, the eye as a different direction. But these are uh, Gamakatsu or uh, VMC, which is pretty standard. I use a lot of VMC hooks, and uh, they're very, very sharp, but they hang straight. Hmm. And that's okay. all, this is sure. the way I do it, so. Very good. Now, let me show you another deal here. This is, uh, this is kind of interesting. And I know a lot of people have never seen this before. Um, guy gets out on the lake and he says, you know what, I, I saw a guy pulling a three-way swivel with a sinker on it and he's got a leader out to the side and he, he's pulling a, a crankbait or a spinner down the lake and I don't have any three-way swivels. You know, what am I going to do? Well, you take two sections of line, just like this. Okay, so you got your line that would go maybe to your rod and you got two sections of line. And you pull it about, oh, I don't know, maybe about a foot or so. You double it. Now you come back and double it again and keep it between your fingers like this. So you got four. So you got four strands of line, okay? And what you do is you're going to twist it again and you're going to come towards you, okay? So it doesn't matter if you're lefty or righty, but you come this way three times and you bring that loop through and then it looks like a little figure, it looks like an eight. Looks like an eight, but don't pull it fast. You pull it real slow, and I wet it a little bit, and then I pull it tight. There you go. So here's what you got. You got a dropper line. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we cut one end of this. It's doing better with the hook. And what I have here is now I've got a dropper. And what I can do is I can tie a, a little uh, bell sinker or something to that. To here. To there. Sure. And then I can tie my there rappler there spinner over here. Yeah, and there away there. we go. Wow. You don't even need a swivel or anything up here. Nope. So right as, long as, you don't, as long as you don't have too long of a lead right. on there and fish it too fast, mm -hmm. you can get away with this without having a three-way. And I learned this down in the ocean, but I learned it also from a trout guy who taught me that and it works fantastically. Now, there is sometimes where we use uh, an outfit called the drop shot rig for bass, smallies and that. And what we do is we do the same thing, the same knot, but we tie a hook on there and we tie it short, maybe about two to three inches, okay. and we put a plastic bait on there it, okay. to kind of emphasize like a minnow. And then I'll put a sinker on the bottom and I'll have this up off the bottom like this. Mm -hmm. So I got a sinker down here and I've got this line up on top. So there's a couple different ways you can do it, okay. but it's real interesting. Another tip. 
It's just another tip. It's okay. something else to, to do. Okay. We're going to have to wrap up here real quick. Uh, we got some other things we wanted to cover here. We might have to have you back oh, on be some great. of this equipment. But uh, you've got a book here. You want I want to show you this real quick, quick about, uh, uh, real fast. And you know, people talk. Fifteen seconds here. Yeah, people talk about you know what size mm -hmm. crankbaits to use, but I'll tell you what. You get a book like this. You know, this is called Precision Trolling, and it actually shows you all these different baits in here, oh, wow. the size of the bait, the dive sure. plane, how much sure. line to let out, and how deep you're going to go. If you're going to troll crankbaits at all, I don't care, day or night, mm -hmm. you stop and get one of these one of these books. And I know Ben Kellen's got a ton of them because okay. we got them to put them in there. Good, good idea. It's great. Okay, uh, one thing we didn't mention is you're, uh, you got elected to the Hall of Fame, right? Yes. Now, tell us a little, just quickly about that. Oh, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, what an experience, you know, yeah. what a humbling experience and yeah. um, to get nominated not only. This is a National Freshwater. This is a National Freshwater Fishing Hall Fishing of Fame. Fame. And um, as far as I know, I'm the only one up this far that, uh, I know Gary Roach and the Linders uh -huh. and sure. uh, quite a few other well-known fishermen, but. Um, for Northern Minnesota. For Northern Minnesota. Represent. And and it's just uh, a great honor and yeah. uh, we had a, we had the deal at Hayward, Wisconsin, and they had a whole bunch of people there, and um, mm -hmm. and you're recommended by your peers, yeah, and good. I got a unanimous uh, vote on it, and yeah. I was elected the same year that uh, Forrest Wood from Ranger Boats and Irwin Jacobs and some very well-known people in the industry. So uh, I think that it was probably your shining thing of your career, and uh, I'm very, very proud of it. Good. Thanks for coming in, Tom. And oh, thank uh, you. Appreciate you giving us your. Uh, information on some of this, your professional information, and uh, I wish you luck in the future, and good to have you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you folks for watching Just Outdoors, and remember, stay informed.